consider an organization. It has data, right? Um, in a database, and typically, of course, uh, as we know, uh, many of them, if you have a sizable organization. But for now, let's stick to one database. And we, as engineers, um, after the past decades, we've optimized the shit out of this. Uh, so within organization, and this, it's all data-driven now, and we optimize things. But to solve and um, and work on the, the big challenges that we face as a society, like um, in the environment or healthcare, eh? more and more um, people are getting old and healthcare is getting more expensive. How can we now optimize over multiple organizations? For example, in healthcare, all the data is in silos. Eh? You have your healthcare practitioner, you have your uh, hospital, uh, health insurance. They all have data, but how do you know what is effective? And we, have, we can only spend the money once, so how can we get these insights? Well, you could say, you know what, we'll put all the data in one place uh, to a big trusted, uh, trusted third party, let it collect, and then we gain those insights. However, in practice, that is not what we want in society. Uh, there is, of course, GDPR. Um, also, you want to have control over your data as an organization. Um, the solution that I would like to talk about or give you more uh, um, insight about is computing on ciphertext. Because with that technology, you can share the insights, not the data. So, um, welcome. Uh, my name is Martin Evans, as introduced. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about computation on ciphertext. Um, like he said, I'm um, CTO of Linksight, a TNO spin-off, a startup here in the Netherlands. We make uh, privacy-preserving data collaborations possible between organizations. I'll talk maybe a bit more about that later. And I'm a part-time assistant professor at the University of Twente, where I luckily work on the same stuff that we do at Linksight. So, in this talk, I have basically three parts. Computing on ciphertext, wait, what? Is that possible? Yes, but I'll show you. Then if you have this, what could you build with it? I'll give you a very well, basic and simple example that should be easy to follow. And then if you want to use this in practice, as we do at Linksight, what else do you need? Um, by the way, if you have questions, please do interrupt me. I like to uh, make this uh, interactive. Um, he has a mic so that uh, also the people uh, watching this online or uh, watching the recording can follow. Um, so let's dive right in. Computing with ciphertext. Suppose you have um, these three organizations, and that is actually the setting where I want to talk about where you have multiple organizations that want to collaborate on data, because that, like I said, is one of the ways we can face those challenges. And um, Together, computing on your data uh, is also called multi-party computation. Who has heard of multi-party computation? Well, not that many, so three. So that's multiple parties together computing on data, typically using cryptography. Um, it's a big, it will become a big thing. It's not the next blockchain uh, term, but um, my prediction, uh, you will see it more and more. And it has a bit more substance to it, actually, as well. Um, if I zoom out, there are basically uh, two important building blocks, uh, cryptographic building blocks, because that's what I'm talking about, um, homomorphic encryption and secret sharing. Um, I will focus now on homomorphic encryption, because I had to pick one, but secret sharing is also very cool and fast and um, interesting. Any cryptographers in the room? No, okay. Um, that's fine and good, actually, um, but remember, uh, do not ever roll your own crypto. Ask a cryptographer, just to make that uh, point. Um, but I will now dive right in. Um, homomorphic encryption. What is it? Well, basically what you can do, you can take your plain text values, like here, three and four, you can encrypt it, and out comes typically a very big number, because it's all math, right, encryption. Um, and then you can do an operation, and the outcome is another encryption, and if you would decrypt that, you would get this original sum, which is weird. 
And that's why I call it magic. Also, typically, it's something you don't want for encryption, yeah, right? Because you want confidentiality and integrity. This doesn't give you integrity, but it gives you the special property of being able to compute with data. So that's good. Um, homomorphic encryption comes in many forms. Um, and at the top, there is partially homomorphic encryption. Um, and it's partially because it can only do one operation. It can only do additions. Or it can only do multiplications. But not both on the same ciphertext. Well, and at the end, you have fully homomorphic encryption. Who has heard of homomorphic encryption, by the way? And I'm not sure if that's the same three people, but um, <laughs> <laughs> probably. Um, but fully homomorphic encryption allows you to compute anything. So basically, um, so most of you will know, if you can do addition and multiplication, you can compute any function. It might take a long time, but you can compute any function. So with fully homomorphic encryption, that is then possible, which is in a way amazing. It's been, been around for a couple of years now and it's getting faster and faster, but it is still quite slow. And that's also what you see here. Uh, at the top, you can do only a limited amount of uh, types of computations. With fully homomorphic encryption, you can do anything you want, fully encrypted, but it's pretty slow. And uh, sometimes the ciphertext are also big or the key material um, can be quite big, as in the key material is in gigabytes. So a um, private key is in gigabyte. Um, which is still doable, by the way, with current hardware, but still, um, it's, um, it's a thing. Well, if you look at homomorphic encryption, you can use this in several ways. And I want to point at two architectures that you can approach. So the I'll start with the centralized one, because in if you use homomorphic encryption in basically in the way that was originally envisioned, you can have all the parties send their data encrypted to a central party. And this central party doesn't know what it has. It only has ciphertexts. And um, it can now do computations with it. For example, compute fancy logistic regression or other statistics. And then it needs to be decrypted. That's another story, I'll get back to that. But you can centralize it, but this centralized cloud, for example, um, doesn't know what it's working on, but it's all together. Another approach is a more distributed approach, where you, um, the organizations, instead of sending all these um, ciphertexts to one place, they distribute it among each other. Very, well, ad hoc. If you need a certain question, then they exchange uh, these kinds of uh, homomorphic encrypted values. I will give a um, more concrete example in a bit. Well, by now you're probably very excited about this fully homomorphic encryption, and you will find in the literature and online these um, abbreviations, CKKS, BFV, TFHE, that is something on a torus, um, those are the main uh, fully homomorphic encryption schemes that are out there. There are several. Um, some have certain properties. They are a bit faster or have smaller ciphertext. But there's no holy grail yet. And it's still the case that if you want to use this, you have to do some cryptographic engineering. You have to pick the right things for your problem. Um, if you actually want to play with it, and we're, of course, at a developers conference. These are three um, open source projects that I would like to um, point to. That's uh, Latigo, eh, from the people um, from Tune Insights in Switzerland. Um, they have a very approachable uh, Go library that can do all kinds of fully homomorphic encryption schemes. It's quite cool. Um, then there's Sama from France. Um, they also have an open source library for um, homomorphic encryption based on the Taurus, which is a bit different, pretty fast, but um, limited to certain applications. And there's OpenFHE, which is a consortium of multiple parties. Uh, I must add, though, if you want to use this, this stuff is patented, really patented. So uh, be careful there. Um, for example, Zama, uh, I know uh, they give this library for free with the MIT license, I think, or BSD. But anyway, pretty open. However, they explicitly do not give you a patent license right? because they want you to 
uh, build stuff and then you can um, get a license from, from them to, for the patent. Uh, but it's really cool that they all open source this and we can play with this. Okay, um, I will now talk about um, a simpler um, homomorphic encryption scheme called PIE, which is a partial homomorphic encryption scheme. I just want to show you this a bit. Um, like I said, some math. Um, just to give you a bit of a feeling of how it works. You don't have to understand it, but for those who are mathematically inclined, you can probably follow. Um, so M is a message to be encrypted. You then also create a random number. Um, and you then compute uh, the ciphertext as shown in point three, uh, where, um, where you take g2 to the power m and r2 to the power n. Um, that is then your ciphertext, uh, which is a big number. Uh, because of the various properties, it's all secure, you have confidentiality, but you can compute with it. And the cool thing now is, and if you, as this is left as an exercise for the reader, um, if you would decrypt here an encryption multiplied by another encryption, the outcome is the sum of those original encrypted values. And you can see it a bit if you, if you look at the exponents. So you, you know that maybe from um, high school that if you, didn't, if you multiply, it will be added, well, somewhat along that direction. But the cool thing is you can take two ciphertexts and then you have um, the sum of those. And let's give this a live demo. So, um, I have to do this here. So this is a simple demo of this uh, Paye uh, crypto scheme, and which I will now do, I will generate a key pair. Maybe I forgot to tell that. Most of those um, homomorphic encryption schemes are asymmetric, as in uh, you need a public and a private key, or you generate a public and a private key. I just did that right now. And uh, so this very large number is the public key, and this is the private key. Um, now what I can do is now encrypt two values. Let's say three and four. I encrypt this, and now again you see yeah, the outcome is a very big number. This is really just a big number. Um, most, and if not all, asymmetric uh, schemes are probabilistic, so that means if I would encrypt again, it would be a completely different value. So you cannot remember this is a four, no, that's not possible. So there's randomness inside as well. Now, what I can do, I can compute, take these two ciphertexts and then compute the sum. Or actually what you do is a multiplication, but the result is an encrypted sum. Um, which is again a big value. I can re-add some um, noise to it, some randomness, so that I can actually pass this along, pass this to a different uh, uh, organization, for example. What I can also do is take this value that I have and then multiply it with another number. So that's A plus B times C. Well, as you can see, another big number. Now, to be able to do these computations, you need the public key. Um, but you cannot, without the private key, you cannot decrypt. If I would pass along this big number to someone with the private key, I can decrypt and it um, gives you the expected result. Now, this is very simple. But you can do uh, fun stuff with this, and you can actually use this to gain insights over multiple parties. Let me show you. Suppose you have three organizations. These are fictitious organizations. Um, we have at the top a hospital, at the bottom we have a healthcare provider, and a statistical bureau. Um, and suppose you want to ask the question, what is the average healthcare cost or, or use uh, in 2022 of persons who use an e-health app actively and have a low socioeconomic status? Uh, as you can see in this sentence, there are three data points from three different parties, and that is what we want to compute. Well, let's create a very, very simple protocol based on this Paillet uh, primitive. 
Party A start. It creates a public key and a private key, just like I did before. It will take its data. Um, it uh, is a table of identifiers. Uh, typically, actually, in healthcare, you cannot use BSN or that kind of stuff. But suppose we have an identifier. We have an extra column called count, and you will soon see why it's there. Uh, and we have uh, the value, the attribute value, which is the cost, say. And uh, using the public key, party A will encrypt all these values. As you can see, it's indeed probabilistic because all these ones are different numbers and also these, uh, attribute, uh, these, encrypt, these values are also encrypted. Now, this table with the encrypted values is sent along to party B. Party B um, takes this and also has the public key that uh, party A generated. And then thinks, okay, what was the question again? So it was the people who actively use the eHealth app. Suppose that's the, the, the ones with the red arrows, right? What it then does is a little trick. It takes the value zero, encrypts it, and then puts that in those places where there's no uh, red arrow, which sort of like strikes through that person okay, by putting an encrypted zero there. Now, it will take that table they just created, pass it along to party C, and remember, because it's encrypted, he, he may have changed some values, but party C cannot see which ones. Okay? So party C won't learn which parties from, uh, which persons from party B um, use the app actively. Now, as you can imagine, party C do something similar. The people with low socioeconomic status are the ones with the red arrows. Um, it will replace those with encrypted zeros, effectively striking them through. And now comes the homomorphic property in place, only now, and that is it can now sum these encrypted counts. And it can do this, but it doesn't know what the value is because it doesn't have the private key. So, next step, it will send that to party A. Party A has the private key. It decrypts it, sees, ah, 28. That means that there are 28 persons that fitted that query. Now, typically what we now do in our product as well, we check, hmm, is this uh, actually okay? Do we want to continue? Is that, no, is that enough people? Um, but then, if so, we can continue. We can do the same for the other column. We encrypt this, uh, so we sum this, so we get the encrypted um, cost. This is sent to party A because, like I said, party C doesn't have the private key. It can decrypt it, 504. It will send that to the other parties. And now all parties know the number of people uh, in the query and the total costs. It can divide those, and then you have the average cost for that group uh, in that query that I just mentioned. Okay, so it's a very simple protocol based on a simple primitive, but to show you that you can do yeah, interesting stuff with um, these kinds of protocols. Before I move on, what else do you need to practice? Some questions, maybe? To repeat your question, your question was, what is actually sent from C to A? Um, is it the whole table again, or is it only these encrypted values? Um, it's the latter. So it's only these encrypted um, aggregates, only those are sent. Because indeed, like you mentioned, otherwise party A would be able to decrypt the whole table and learn what is a zero. But a uh, good point, good point, yeah. Yeah. 
in, in this simple protocol, indeed, everybody is using um, parties A's public key to do the encryption of the zero and um, randomize. Yeah, indeed. Question at the back. Yeah. Um, are there several cyber attacks that are decrypted to the same number then? Is that what's happening there or why is it there? Okay, good question. So the question was, um, in my live demo, I also had this randomized button. Um, what does that mean? Uh, what is, um, is there, are there multiple cyber attacks that would decrypt um, to the same plain text? That's your question, right? Yeah. So actually that's true. Um, so um, if, I go back. You can sort of see it here. Uh, there's this, in step two, there's this randomness um, that is always inside a ciphertext. So, and also the ciphertext is always bigger than the plain text, quite a bit bigger, in particular in Paillet. So yes, um, there are multiple ciphertexts that can decrypt to the same plain text. And that's also what you want with this probabilistic val um, property so that if you get a ciphertext, you cannot Ooh, that was a four before. Um, if I get the same thing, I can now know it's a four. So that's what you want to um, prevent. So that's why there's always this randomness. And indeed, it would result in multiple ciphertexts getting to the same plain text. And the ciphertext space is quite a bit bigger, like 800 times bigger in Paillet. So um, it's quite uh, big because the key size is typically like 2,000 to 4,000 bits, which means that the ciphertexts are approximately as big. Yeah. Thanks. Another question. In the simple protocol, wouldn't the three parties uh, be required to, to exchange plain personal data beforehand to match the IDs? Yeah, indeed. So the question was, shouldn't they uh, have to, well, um, exchange information to be able to match the IDs. Um, that's true, um, that's indeed another problem, but I tried to um, tackle one problem at a time. But indeed, that's very much true. You have to decide on how do we match and do we find it a problem whether or not we can see each other's IDs, yeah, because otherwise you have to do private set intersection for those in the know. Uh, good question, thanks. I will now have to dive through the protocol again, okay. So, um, this was all well and good, but suppose you actually really want to do this, and eh, which we have done at Linksight, what else do you need? Um, I am a computer scientist, and uh, like I said, I, I like this cryptographic stuff. Um, it's yeah, my bread and butter, but it's not a silver bullet. Let me show you. Suppose, um, Six people here in the front row, we say, you know what, together we will compute our average salary. And particularly in the Netherlands, that's a touchy thing. So we use um, MPC for that. Yeah, so we use this fancy cryptography. Actually, you can do it also by paper, but you, do, you use fancy cryptography to compute the average salary of six people here. Um, that works fine. Uh, of course, you first have to decide on... Um, are we talking about month, year, net, gross? And that's stuff you have to agree on, which is, by the way, also an important thing you have to agree on before you can do this kind of computation on ciphertext, because you cannot see what's happening. So you cannot do, as you would normally, as a data scientist, probably do, like, look at the data a bit. You can't do that. So you have to really agree on what you're computing. But suppose an average comes out. And then I pick one of you, and I say, you know what? You go step outside, and we do it again in a privacy-preserving way. Of course, then um, we get a new, new value, and we learn exactly the um, salary of that person we sent away. So we have to be careful, even if you have these cool privacy-enhancing technology. Similarly, suppose you have three organizations, they say, OK, let's use such a fancy product um, to, uh, to have analysis over multiple parties. And we can do queries, right, like the one I said before. And we do some more queries. But then there's someone who's a bit clever and says, you know what, I will do many queries. And each query a bit different. And as you can imagine, 
you can then learn a lot about the whole, about the different databases by carefully crafting queries. So also there, you need control. Or suppose you do a query on a population of persons and you say, I want people with a certain gender and certain uh, income who live in Amsterdam, work at booking.com. Well, you do this query and only three people come out. That's also a problem. Yeah, because then actually you learn a lot about these, these three people. So what we feel you need is that you need data collaboration governance. And of course, governance is a word that people have very different hallucinations from what it is. But in our case, we feel it is about um, understanding why and how you collaborate and having rules in place that um, everybody feels comfortable about and also that most of these rules will be actively um, enforced by uh, software. And that's another point. Um, oh, I have a question there. Can you repeat the question? I couldn't hear you that well. Uh, yes, and yeah, the, the, let me rephrase your question. Um, so whether or not you can use the fancy ciphertext and encryption to limit what you can actually compute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, you can. Um, what I didn't show you, for example, in this protocol, um, is that um, in the, the scheme or similar scheme that we actually use in our product, where um, there's not a single party who creates a key pair, they collaboratively generate a key pair where you actually need all parties to be able to decrypt. So um, if a query comes in, all the parties agree, oh, this is a valid qu uh, query and they will do the thing. Um, and then if there's an outcome, they have to collaborate to be able to decrypt. So in this way, you always have control. If you want to have more control, there's uh, one of my PhD students has been working on it. You can have even more cryptographic control, but this is already a first step that you can well always have control because the private key material is spread among parties. Does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Um, another aspect that I want to emphasize is that uh, MPC is not a GDPR whitewashing machine. So um, if you um, use um, these fancy privacy enhanced technologies like MPC, homomorphic encryption, you still um, have to well, do all kinds of stuff to, ad to adhere to a GDPR. Because if you talk to legal people, they have a different vocabulary from us. That's what I noticed. Um, so they say encryption, an encryption of something is a pseudonym. If it's an encryption of a personal identifier information, it is a pseudonym. Where maybe you and I would think of pseudonymization as just removing some identifiers. Um, but no, for legal people, um, that is um, not the same. So encryption is still a pseudonym, is personal information, so you have to have consent or a ground to be able to use it. However, the cool thing is that this kind of technology is a very good way to limit the risk. Um, and um, because it is not a whitewashing machine, you still need to do a DPIA. Who knows what a DPIA is? <laughs> yeah. A data privacy impact assessment, which is a legal document that describes the um, probabilities of bad things happening and what measures you take to prevent them. And of course, one of these measures could be this kind of technology where you can still um, have the insight. And of course, you still need what they call a joint controller agreement. So you still have to do that. Um, if you want to do this in practice, and now I'll give you a bit of a product demo, sorry, uh, but just to give you a bit of um, feeling if you want to do this in practice. Uh, 
And this is um, just to show you a bit of architecture, what um, this can look like. Here you can see uh, three organizations. They want to collaborate. Um, on that side, there's a collaboration service to uh, make sure that they can find each other, which is somewhat centralized, but doesn't see any data. But all the organizations, um, they install what we call the data station, and they have their, their governance interface, their analysis interface, but it's all installed on-prem or actually within their own legal boundary, as in cloud. Um, that's also what we noticed. On-prem is way out, but that's what you already know. But um, I was hoping that maybe in healthcare it's not the case, but also there they're uh, moving much to the cloud. But they are in full control. And the idea is then, if they're collaborating, then in the future they can find other people to collaborate with and then um, yeah, do all kinds of analyses. Um, how much time do I have? 15 minutes. Okay. You know what? Live demo instead of screenshots? No. <laughs> Always <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> so um, I have to, so I can see my screen there. That's why I'm looking uh, right now. So, um, so what we um, thought, you know what? We have this governance that's important, and of course the analysis. And um, we use two roles for that. That is the data steward, who basically sets the rules of um, what the data scientist can do, and the data, data scientists themselves, they basically do the analysis. And um, now I'm logged in as a data steward for a healthcare company, a fictitious healthcare company. And, um, it has a number of compute groups or data collaborations that it's part of, and uh, it can inspect those, it can invite other organizations, and it can view the active governance rules. Just to give you a bit of example, what did I put there? So that this rule set is valid until a certain point in time, which is always a good thing to have, that what can you compute, huh, which relates to the question in the back. You can only do basic statistics, like descriptive statistics. Um, and if you do a query, the number of people that are in the result set should be at least, what did I put there, 20. Um, and this is all agreed upon. I will not go through this actively. It will take too long. But what you can do is you can say, you know what, let's create a new rule set. And you can uh, add governance rules, for example, um, when it should expire, maybe soonish. Uh, let me add one more. That's the downside of live demos. That's, uh, you have to keep on talking. And, um, for example, you could say, um, who can start the analysis? Um, I was actually looking for rate limiting. Oh, there. Thanks. You can um, say, you know what? Let's limit it to five per 24 hours. So that's also one way to make sure that um, people are not over querying uh, things. Um, well, well, suppose this is the new rule set that I want. I can now propose it. And uh, the other organizations, I can briefly show this. I will not go through this, but um, we'll see it in its inbox. Ooh, there's a new governance rule set you have to vote for, and then you can. Um, well, it's this, this one, actually. You can uh, vote for it, um, and then if everybody agrees, then that's um, the new rule set. I will not do that right now because it will take too long, because I will now immediately jump to the fun stuff, and that is the analysis. So what now um, a data scientist can do, it can inspect what rules are there. Um, basically, it's the gates within uh, it can do stuff and which is automatically enforced, it can inspect, ooh, these data sets are available. Um, so for each of the organizations, there's a description of the data, which is, of course, very important. Uh, and it can do an actual analysis. And um, as you can see, this is somewhat like a front end for doing SQL queries, right? You can um, compute the mean of um, healthcare cost for 
um, females and then group by whether or not they used an e-health app and well, let's not use that but um, education and as you can see now you use different attributes of different um, organizations and uh, it will already show you this is the kind of result you get so all these dots here will be aggregates um, and if I now do submit then three or actually more um, data stations will now exchange these um, encrypted homomorphic encrypted values to compute these aggregates this will actually take a while uh, because uh, that's one downside, of course, of these uh, fancy encryption schemes. They're a bit slower than doing this on plain text. Uh, this is a database of, I think, 10 to 20,000 persons. Um, and it will take like half a minute or something, or 20 seconds, depending on how busy our cloud is. But I can also show you some results. Um, it's a very boring data set, as you can see. Let me... Sorry. Um, it can show you these kinds of results. Uh, of course, there's also a Python interface and R interface for the data scientists. They don't want to use this uh, front end. I see a question there. This is a fully homomorphic, so you can do all math operations? No, this is uh, partially homomorphic um, because we want to have this a bit of more speed, but we also have a, um, an implementation that does uh, logistic regression, um, which needs a bit more. But uh, yeah, another question in the back. Since you obviously have a test set that you're using, um, you can say if the outcome is what you expected it to be. But if it's not, then how do you debug it since you can't see the intermediate steps? That is an excellent point and also a problem. So the, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, <laughs> It's a problem in the way that you have to do this testing very carefully. And so we, in our product, we, we have all kinds of data sets where we do the query on plain text and then also in encrypted form and make sure that they're the same. Um, but also for the users, um, when they get an odd outcome, they say, oh, that's odd. What a data scientist normally would do, it would just plot some values, right? And say, ah, there's an outlier there. Oh, yeah, that I, I forgot that the date was in this and that format. And well, let's fix it. So that's why, in particular, if you do this kind of stuff, the, um, the semantic description of the data set is very important. And that you also enforce it. And that this is a date should be like this. This is um, blood pressure. And it's typically within those ranges. Um, so you really enforce so that you don't get confusion on what you compute. Because it is maybe somewhat of a black box, right? Um, that's why we also sometimes say this is a bit of a tangent. So you could do this to, do, to train your AI. But then you have two problems. All right, so you have um, MPC-like stuff, which is a black box AI that you don't fully understand. Um, and cannot explain, so that's why we, for now, actually stick to the simple stuff because that uh, works and also gives uh, insight. Excellent question. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say one way to test that might be the parties would agree on a test set that they would sort of submit and be able to see here's a test set each each of the members would submit and yes, it comes out with a correct answer as a as a test method. Yeah, that's actually how we also do it. When we roll it out with our clients, they start with loading a test set, do some queries, all works, and then they move to the real stuff. And so, yeah. yeah. Um, so that was my demo. If there are questions about the demo, let me know. So I, of course, obviously also prepared some screenshots. Um, but, um, my main message is, with this cool technology, homomorphic encryption, secret sharing, um, multi-party computation, it is possible to um, gain the insights without actually sharing the data. Um, and I think that is, will become more and more important uh, in the future. So um, if you want to learn more about this or collaborate on that or just want to play with it, let me know. Thanks.